the basic troubleshooting mindset. Now, when I go into some specifics, basically this is my highlight reel of stuff that I'm good, talk, uh, good, uh, good at talking about. At least I like to think I am. Electrical, refrigeration circuit, uh, best practices, installation practices, commissioning, that sort of stuff, airflow, all that. When it comes to gas furnaces, I'm probably gonna result in you killing somebody if you listen to me too much. So I'm not, we're not gonna talk gas furnaces. That's not, I know you have a lot of them here, um, but I, you know, I'm from Florida, right? We do a decent amount of 80%, but not that much. So most of you could probably teach me something about gas furnaces. What is troubleshooting? How do we troubleshoot best? What are the first steps? It always starts by listening. Good troubleshooters, good diagnosticians are people who listen far more than they talk. We've all met the guy, and hope maybe some of you may be the guy. Uh, if you are, that's okay, just work on it. Where they go in wanting to be the hero right away. They're wanting to prove how smart they are right away. Hop right in, oh, it's a capacitor, that's simple. That's, these things go bad all the time. Blah, 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 diary of the mouth, right? A good troubleshooter is good at finding faults right away but doesn't need to talk until they've got all the information. Because that customer may share some information with you that it may not just be the first layer. I didn't put it in here, but one of the really popular things that I shared on social media was the, the hierarchy of technicians. You know, it was based on Maslow's hierarchy of need, but it was a pyramid and it showed the different types of technicians. And all the way down at the bottom was the, you know, the sales tech, down there the parts changer, you know, and then at the top was what we call the unicorn tech. And it's of course a joke, but the idea is they're just it's hard to, it's easy to find as a unicorn. And these unicorn techs, what they do is they don't just find the problem. They don't just fix, fix the problem. They don't just fix the problem and find the cause of the problem, but they also optimize the entire system as part of what they do. So some easy ones, things like a compressor, for example. You know, Emerson Copeland talks about this ad nauseum because they don't want their compressors to keep you know, being sent back when there's nothing wrong with them at the very least. But if you have a compressor that's failed, say it has a shorted winding, it's grounded. Let's say it's grounded. If you stop there, you're gonna often miss the reason why the compressor is grounded. If you find the reason why the compressor is grounded and you stop there, you may miss significant system optimizations that can be made. Often, airflow, let's be real honest. I mean, airflow is the thing, duct design, all that, installation uh, practices, that's huge. Could be long line set, could be what, could be what took it out. So how could long line set result in an electrical failure? Well, anything that causes Overheating over time can cause an electrical failure, can cause a mechanical failure. A mechanical prop failure can cause an electrical failure, right? I always, I always like it when a technician goes out in Florida, this is again, Florida man, you know, everything happens in Florida for whatever reason. You go out and it's grounded, whatever's wrong with it, capacitor's blown, it's always lightning. It's amazing. Now we do have a lot of lightning in Florida, but lightning gets blamed for everything. It's probably lightning, you know, that's probably what took the compressor out. You know, most of the time, an electrical failure is caused by some sort of mechanical failure. A lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time. And the example that I always give is, it's like saying you got a ceiling fan and the motor's burned out. And you say, well, you know, it's, that's an electrical failure. It has nothing to do with the fact that Jimmy's been standing there, you know, holding it still for the last half an hour and spinning it backwards and whacking it with a, you know, with a, with a hammer or whatever, you know, like mechanical failure, failures cause electrical failures all the time. So knowing that, We've got to drill down to the cause. But once we find the cause, then we even need to get a little further and find the actual source. And listening is one of the best ways. And also, you'll see here, at Kalos, we do not have a policy against mullets for our installers. We're gonna do the five pillars first, uh, which is one of the first documents I ever wrote for training was when I was working at a, at a large uh, company that primarily did residential new construction. Five things. Now, some of you who see this list of five measurements um, are gonna be like, well, but where is static pressure? Well, this static pressure isn't here. And it's just because I'm not actually somebody who thinks that you need to measure static pressure on every single service call, even though I'm a huge advocate of measuring static pressure. I'm also not somebody who thinks that uh, you should put gauges on every system that you touch. In fact, we talked about many times about non-invasive testing. But this is not about taking a system that we already assume to be working properly and just confirming that it's working properly. This is when you know you have a refrigerant system problem. There's something going on in the refrigerant circuit and you need to test them. The reason why I, I did this initially was that when we first started getting TXVs, and again, some of this is like 
and I, I, I mean, I like to think I'm a pretty young guy, but a lot of this stuff is already dated. Like everything's coming with TXVs now. When I first got into the trade in 1999, 2000, the majority of systems were fixed orifice. The majority of them had pistons, uh, some sort of fixed orifice. And so when we went to TXVs, everybody's like, well, you charge a TXV by fill in the blank. What do you charge a TXV by? What's the method? Subcooling, right? So they'd say, charge it by subcooling. So what does that mean? You hit the subcooling number, you're halfway to your truck jumping in it. Like you're ready to go, right? But the problem with that is, is that it, it, it's more than that, especially when you're troubleshooting an issue. So a lot of guys would say some version of, charge is good. How do you know the charge is good? Because the subcooling is 10 or 12 or eight or whatever, right? The charge is good. Well, just because you hit a particular number on subcooling doesn't mean that the charge is good because we don't know if there's some other problem with the piece of equipment. You could have a severe restriction in a liquid line dryer and still hit a 10 degree subcooling before the dryer and the system not be working properly. You could have a 10 degree subcooling and you could have a metering device that's significantly overfeeding or underfeeding and that doesn't mean that it's all as well. When I first wrote this, this is one of the main things I was trying to get people to do. Don't just say, I set the charge by. And why don't we just say, I set the charge by blank and now all is good. Because load changes, lots of things change. Filter loads up, whatever the case may be. You can't just use a single number. And that's what I was trying to get people to go away from now. Now, our list has gotten a little longer. And even some of the things that we've started testing now, like total system delivered capacity, well, we can do that now. In 1999, 2000, you know how they were teaching us to do calculation to see how many BTUs a cooling system was removing. You, you know the method that they would use at that time for doing that, the standard method for figuring out your airflow and then calculating the system BTUs? Anybody, anybody know off the top of their head? A bunch of math. Oh, there you go. There you go. He's naming the math. It's a bunch of math. And there's nothing wrong with the math. And there's nothing wrong with knowing the math. I'm a fan of knowing the math. We teach that. It's great. But the problem is, is that they were teaching you to use thermocouple, little bead thermocouple, covered in a little wet sock with what kind of water? Distilled water, right? Because we all keep distilled water in our trucks, right? <laughs> At all times. Distilled water stuck in the duct in the right position, in the right airstream, da 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 da. And then you do the math and then you come up with the answer. The problem is, Jim Bergman talks about this all the time. The problem is, if for those of you who have done that outside of a lab environment, in, out in the field, you'll find that you'd get all kinds of different answers with so much variation, so much so that it's almost pointless, right? So that's why in 2000 or whatever night I wrote this, delivered capacity isn't part of this list. But nowadays it could as just as well be, because if you use measure quick and some, you know, the field piece, we're gonna keep a brand agnostic here, field piece testo UEI probes that are good psychrometers and reasonably new, so they're not all gummed up and, you know, given bad readings. And you're gonna get a pretty good idea of how the system's operating in terms of BTUs. And almost as easy essentially as easy as measuring a delta T at that time. So nowadays you could take this list and you could actually eliminate delta T and put delivered capacity in there. Total BTUs removed, total BTUs added by the equipment. And it would be almost as easy of a measurement and a much better actual look at system performance. But starting here, now when I say, see, see if anybody knows, when I originally wrote this, I wrote suction pressure and head pressure. But what's a better thing to list there than suction pressure and head pressure on this list of things that you always measure? Saturation, Saturation right? And when I started doing refrigeration, which now is a, a good percentage, if not the bulk of what we do, those guys use even a different term. They don't even tend to say saturation. Sometimes they do, but they'll say something different. Do you know what they call head pressure? They'll call it condensing temperature or condenser temperature. It's like, huh. That's actually kind of cool, right? Because that's actually true. As long as that refrigerant is in the process of changing state, i.e. condensing, that head pressure, you converted to the refrigerant on the PT chart, is actually the condensing temperature. So now when you think about that number, rather than thinking of a pressure, you're thinking of a temperature. Maybe that temperature is 110 degrees. Is that good? Is that bad? We'll talk about how you know, but you can know pretty quick. And then these are what we call, <clears throat> there's a term for this in science called heuristics. Fancy word, and it just means mental shortcuts. So in our brains, we think this, we think that. Our brain just goes, doop, doop, makes that connection. And I think for many years, we've made things more complicated than it needed to be. And in doing that, people just ignore it. They can't come up with an easy this than that comparison. But if you take these numbers and you make that just quick 
This isn't head pressure, this is condensing temperature. And what do we compare that to to know anything? The medium to which we are rejecting the heat, right? If the condenser is a heat rejector, we're rejecting the heat somewhere, what's the temperature of the thing we're rejecting the heat to? If it's 100 degree condensing temperature and it's 80 degrees outside the air, there's a 20 degree split between those two. Is that good, is that bad? Well, gotta know something about the equipment, but you know, it generally doesn't sound too bad, right? So heuristics, shortcuts, it's helpful. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.